Welcome everybody. We're really glad you're here tonight. This is our fourth talk in our climate speaker series and um, they've all just been fabulous and I'm sure you'll enjoy tonight's as well. Um, my name is Linda Leishaw. I'm the district manager for the conservation district and I'm one of the partners that are putting this on. I want to thank our partners, um, Madrona Institute, National Park Service, League of Women Voters, and several others that have helped sponsor this event and pull together all these speakers. So um, I want to uh, talk just briefly about our community solar program. If you're interested, I have a sign-up sheet here. And all you need to do is put your name and email or address, and I'll email you information about it. There's no uh, obligation. It's just uh, information about it. The community solar program benefits our local schools. We're putting four solar arrays on each of the school districts on the four islands. All the electricity is generated to the school, and you get your money back. It's like a microloan. So you get a, an annual check, which is a production incentive check. So it's a really good program. It's a win-win. Um, in addition, Bonneville Environmental Foundation is providing educational curriculum for all the students on renewable energy and um, also science kits. And so it's a, a part of, of the program. And they'll be monitoring the solar energy that is, um, is, is generated and, and that goes onto the grid. So it's, it's a pretty exciting project and we're really enjoying uh, doing, well, putting it together. The pass is around. If you're interested, just put down your name and, and address and I'll mail you the information. Okay, um, now I would like to introduce our speaker. Laura Whiteley Binder is the Outreach Specialist at Climate Impacts Group. I've heard Laura speak a number of times and have always been very impressed with her, so I'm really happy she's here tonight. Um, Laura, uh, a couple years ago, facilitated the Blue Ribbon Panel, um, the Governor's Blue Ribbon Panel on Ocean Acidification. So if you have any questions about that, she can probably answer those as well. Um, tonight she's going to help uh, talk about our uh, impacts and, and adaptation to climate impacts in the Northwest. So without further ado, I'm going to let Laura tell you more about her. Great. Thanks. Is going to warm up? Oh, there you go. All right. Well, thank you. Let me see if I can stand out of the way here. Uh, I was up here with my family, and we were out at American camp, and my kids saw this and saw my picture there, and they think I'm a rock star. Uh, so I appreciate, I appreciate the boost that you have given me for my chil to my children and the reputation I have with them. I think that will last about two seconds until I say no to something, and then I'm back in the basement where I started. So thanks for the opportunity to come up here. I'm always happy to come up to Friday Harbor. Who isn't? So I wanted to start with a brief overview or a brief introduction to the group that I work with. Uh, I work with the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington. We are an interdisciplinary group of researchers and technical experts based at the U who have been studying the impacts of climate variability and climate change on the Northwest and the Western U.S. since 1995. Our work is aimed at producing scientific information that is both useful to and used by decision makers. It's kind of a revolutionary idea, this, you know, coupling these things together. We've got, you know, centuries of scientific information that's been put out in the journals and it's just, you know, assumed it's out there for people to use. It's a whole other thing to actually try to bring the stakeholder community you know, to the science and, and trying to make sure that it's useful. And I'm, I'm happy to say that I think that has, um, that that revolution is taking place within the scientific community, that you're seeing, you know, the, the waves of graduate students that are coming through the U all want to do applied work. They want their work to matter to the communities that they're working with and the world that we live in. So this, this kind of revolutionary idea of, of coupling these things is, is um, really taking hold and transforming the way people do science and the science that they do. So our work, uh, in the, in the, in, while doing our work, we are conducting climate relevant or decision relevant research that's aimed at identifying and getting a better understanding of emerging risks associated with both climate variability and climate change and trying to provide this information to help illuminate 
options or, or ways moving forward to deal with these impacts. Then we also do a lot of work uh, working with decision makers to help interpret the volumes of scientific information that's out there and how it, how it relates to what they do. In many cases, we may be actually producing or generating climate scenarios that are specific to decisions that decision makers are trying to make. In other cases, we're doing, uh, we're writing syntheses and assessments. Uh, I'll have an example of a couple of those at the end. And then we're providing general expert guidance on risk assessment and planning. So this is uh, the name, this is the group that I work with. We're housed in the College of the Environment at the U, and we're also part of the Northwest Climate Science Center uh, that is part of the Department of the Interior. So I want to start with my key conclusions. Does anybody remember when Harry met Sally? How Sally, one of the big issues between uh, Billy Crystal and, and uh, Meg Ryan is like she always went to the end of the book and started and, and had to read the last page first, and that drove him nuts. Um, you know, this is our when Harry, Harry met Sally moment, you know, moment. This is what I want you to know if the babysitter calls. Okay, we're toast. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so, not really. Okay, I mean, I am kidding. I mean, we're not really, we're not toast. I'm not saying not really, I'm kidding. Um, I, am I bet at least half of you assume that I'm coming in here as the harbinger of doom. And, and probably the other half that just made that assumption probably aren't even here because like, oh God, I don't want to go hear another gloom and doom talk. And I get that. I mean, there's not a lot of good news when it comes to climate change. I, I gave a talk once and I had a woman ask me during the Q&A, how do you get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> well, like everybody else, right? <laughs> what am I going to do? Lay down in front of the train and say, okay. Um, you know, I, you know it, there's not a lot of good news. You know, typically, and, and the way that it's reported and, and all. But my, my hope today, and I should say, um, we're, you know, like, we're not toast, at least not yet. But my hope today is just to, to leave you with this understanding, or at least this sense, that there is actually a lot that's happening with regards to climate change. I've been doing this job since 2000. I stumbled into climate change work and, and climate variability. I actually went to the uh, graduate school at the U to study water policy and had an opportunity to start doing some work with the climate impacts group with some engagement that they were doing with water managers. And you know, at the time that I started working with them, my my like whole summary of climate change was like, okay, I need to walk more, combine trips, you know, on to the next problem. So I you know I didn't come into this field with this this lifelong driven goal to deal with climate change. And I'll tell you that in the, the 14 years that I've been working with this group, I have seen a radical transformation in the dialogue around climate change and who's talking about it and what they're saying and how people are really internalizing the need for action. Is that enough? No, we still have a lot of work to do. And I'm talking about both in terms of mitigation, in terms of reducing greenhouse gases, as well as in terms of adaptation, which is what our group focuses on. So I'm hopeful. I am hopeful. I get out of bed every morning because I am hopeful that we are going to deal with this problem in ways that actually add value, actually, to our, our world, our societies, and our communities. Um, I don't think it's going to be easy. Nobody said it would be. So yes, we've got some difficult choices ahead. But I want you guys to, to feel that hope, too. So there we go. I hope so. I hope, I hope I've accomplished that. You'll have to let me know at the end. So we're not toast. Um, but we've got some work to do. All right, so here are actually are my real key points. So, you know, by the time I'm done with this talk, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have an overview that, and an understanding that the, our ecosystems, our communities, and our economy are sensitive to changes in climate. And that global and regional climate is already changing, and that these changes are expected to accelerate in the coming decades that there is growing awareness, as I've mentioned, and also that the need, knowledge, and the tools for acting exists today. This is not something where we need to um, kind of wait for those. And as I noted, we, you know, we still have a ways to go. You know, we, we are, are we're really just kind of at the cusp of this. But this is, this is the long marathon. You know, this is the new norm. And I think what happens a lot is that the people who work day to day day in, day out on climate issues, 
feel that sense of urgency because we're steeped in it. You know, every day we're getting bombarded with this information, and you know, and you just you kind of feel like this. Come on, we gotta go. We gotta go. You know, it's like your kid trying to get to Disneyland. We gotta go. We gotta go now. 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 Right. And. In the meantime, the rest of the world is the parents saying, yeah, okay, I know we need to go. I, I know we need to go to the beach, but I got to get the sunscreen over here. I got to get the towels. I got to pack lunch. You know, that's the rest of the world. That doesn't mean we're not getting there. But there is this, this kind of feeling, I think, that's easy for um, people who work in the climate change world to forget that the world's dealing with a lot of issues, and it takes time. And that's why, you know, the, the progress that we're seeing, I'm, I'm happy with, but obviously I'm hoping that we do pick it up. So, whoops, it doesn't help if I point it to the screen. Um, I want to emphasize, feel free to ask questions at any point. There's no need to wait till the end. So I want to start just by pointing out that we live in a world of embedded expectations about normal climate. You know, we have built our water supply systems, our energy systems, our health, public health systems, our recreational systems, and our emergency response systems for dealing with things like floods and fires, and, and as well as our kind of planning around things like floods, all on these expectations that climate, for the most part, behaves as it has in the past with, you know, some deviations, but, you know, within what is quote-unquote considered normal. But we're changing the climate through burning of fossil fuels and land use changes. And we're seeing those changes in multiple ways. We're seeing it through these really kind of slow incremental changes. Uh, this is a, a quote from an article in the New York Times about Miami and the city of Miami and how they're wrestling with both the politics and the realities of climate change and sea level rise in the city. Uh, I think this, this quote is, is so common in the sense of our observations and, and, and our recognition, that awareness that, huh, you know, these things that used to happen every so often, used to never happen, seem to be happening a lot more frequently. It's kind of the slow change. And then there are these, these bigger shocks that will happen, come along, uh, the big droughts, the big heat waves, the big fires, and then our more intense events, which are in, in, in some cases linkages to climate change have been made, in other cases it is certainly indicative of the kinds of changes that we would expect as a result of rising greenhouse gas emissions. So we're changing the climate and we're changing it in ways that are actually committing us to change for several centuries and this has to do with the resonance time of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So it's not a situation where we stop producing greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow and boom, you know, we've fixed the problem. There's a residence time for these gases. It takes several centuries, up to a thousand years in some cases, for sea level rise for these changes to essentially uh, finish out even after we stop increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. All right, so what changes have we seen? This is a really nice summary figure from the recent national assessment that was released in April of 2014. It's a great website if, uh, if you're interested in, in exploring that site. Ten indicators of a warming world. We have seen through a, a growing body of observational data and instrumental data that our average global temperature is increasing. It's increased one and a half degrees between 1881 and 2012. Uh, global sea level has increased seven inches since 1901. Uh, we are getting more extreme heat events and extreme precipitation events. We are getting, uh, we are seeing reduced snow and ice cover in many parts of the world, most parts of the world. Our oceans are getting warmer, both at the surface and at depth. And the acidity of our oceans, as you heard, for those of you who came to uh, Jan's talk, the acidity of the ocean is increasing. It's increased 26% since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So lots and lots of things that are pointing to the fact that the world is changing as a result of these rising greenhouse gases. So, which leads me to my next slide, that the cause of this is, is very clear. You know, greenhouse gases are rising. This is a figure that it's, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. This is showing 
you know, the pretty steady uptick of, of CO2 in the atmosphere since monitoring at Mauna Loa started in 1956. You can actually uh, go much further back and with other sources of data to see longer term changes, and I'll get to that in a moment. We know that greenhouse gases are rising. We know that these gases warm the atmosphere. This, this may be a, the, the cliff clave, in fact, a little known fact. Um, our understanding of how greenhouse gases affect global temperature has been understood since 1824. This is not new science. This has been established. 1820s was when uh, some of the first research on greenhouse gases came out of the role of carbon dioxide, 1850s uh, with Alfred Tyndall. That was another, another big scientist who really, who first put forth the idea that rising greenhouse gases, rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would actually increase global temperatures. The first calculation of how much temperature global temperature would change from a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere was done in 1899. So this is long established. And a lot of that work, I should note, was actually done in the interest of finding out what caused the ice ages. So that was the big exciting question in the mid-1800s. So we know that these gases are going up. We know that they warm the atmosphere. We know that the concentration of, of methane and carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere are higher now than they have been in at least 800,000 years. We know this from ice core data. And we also know that the rate of increase that we've seen over the last 100 years is higher than any time in the last 20,000 years. You know, all of this combined with the instrumental data, the observational data, the climate modeling has led the scientific community to conclude that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. There's, there's no doubt that it's been warming. And that it's extremely likely, in this case, that actually has a specific probability associated with it, which is uh, greater than 95%, that the human influence has been the dominant cause since the 1950s. So I want to provide a little perspective on these changes. You know, have we had greenhouse gas concentrations in our atmosphere that have been higher in our geologic history? Yes. As I mentioned, you know, right now the, the totals are higher than anything in the last 800,000 years. But if we look back in our geologic history, we've had concentrations that are higher. And we've had temperatures that are higher. And that's often one of the arguments, you know, you know so what? So we've had this in the past. This is. You know, and then the reasons for those past geologic changes are, are varied. But here's the key thing, you know, besides the fact that we, there's, there's lots of reasons why we know that today's changes are due to human causes, you know, back, you know, eight, more than, you know, a million years ago, 800,000 plus years ago, we didn't have social, economic, and cultural systems that assumed a steady climate. And this is really where we really start to run into problems. That and the rate of change. The rate of change that's projected for the next 100 years is significant. So just to give you an idea, uh, the global projections and the range of, I think, uh, average change by the end of the century is about 7 degrees, but the range is much higher. And if we look at the average temperature today versus what the average temperature was at the peak of the last ice age, the difference is only 9 degrees. But that's about, you know, 20,000 years to change 9 degrees. We're talking about changes on the order of, you know, 7 degrees in 100 years. So it's that rate of change that's really the problem, right? How do we adapt our social systems? How do we get our handle on this? And how do we adapt those social systems? And our, how do our ecological systems adapt at such a rapid pace? That's the challenge. So how have things changed in the Northwest? First, uh, we have experienced an increase in uh, warming. We've seen uh, more frost-free nights, uh, increase of about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit in average temperature for the Northwest, which is Washington, Oregon, and Idaho combined. Uh, the frost-free season has lengthened about 35 days. We really haven't seen much of a change in long-term precipitation, although there is evidence of increasing extreme precipitation in the Northwest. We have seen uh, long-term changes in snow and ice and stream flows. We've seen a reduction in snowpack of about 25% in the Washington and Oregon Cascades um, through 2006. Most glaciers have been in decline. And we've also seen shifts in the timing of, of 
stream flows depending on what river you're looking at. Um, but largely, as particularly these snow, these snow dependent rivers have seen this shift in the timing of flows. We've seen sea level rise in many locations and sea level fall in other locations. And this is one of those things that uh, can often be a little confusing. And that's because there's global sea level rise and then there's relative sea level rise or the sea level rise at any given place. And that's going to be influenced by what's happening now in, globally in the oceans, but also what's happening with the land elevation. And we live in a very tectonically active region. We've got areas of uplift and subsidence. And so in areas of up, strong uplift, such as out at Nia Bay, you, can act, you actually get sea level fall because the rate of uplift is greater than the rate of sea level rise. In areas where you have subsidence because of plate tectonics or even because, uh, say, for example, like the city of Olympia, which is built on fill, and that fill is compacting you know, over time, or because of groundwater withdrawals, you can get compaction. That is creating, essentially, a situation where the land surface is falling while sea level is rising, and so you can get higher rates of relative sea level rise in those locations. So we kind of have this thing in the Northwest where we're seesawing all over the place. If you were to look at the outer coast of Washington and Oregon, where, where, where we've got sea level rise, then fall, and rise again, and fall again, all up and down the coast because of really what's going on with these plate tectonics. Here's just for reference, local reference though, here's the long-term trend for Friday Harbor, which is uh, one of the few locations in Washington State where we have some, some good um, long-term sea level uh, data. And this is from NOAA. So, you know, not a huge amount of increase, but, but it is going up about, you know, about a third of a foot, almost four, th or four tenths of a foot in 100 years. And as Jan has, uh, and, and I'm sure other speakers in the past have noted, uh, we've got increasing ocean acidity along the Washington coast and warming temperatures off the BC coast and, and some of the inland waters. So are these regional changes due to climate variability or are they due to climate change? Can we say that all of these things I've just walked you through are caused by humans? and rising greenhouse gases. Well, you, we can't say conclusively that it's due to human causes, and we can't say conclusively that it's only due to climate variability. Really, evidence suggests both. You know, the Pacific Northwest climate is changing, and, and the snowpack and all these other issues that I've highlighted, they're changing in ways that we expect as a result of rising greenhouse gases, and they're also changing in ways that are consistent with changes happening elsewhere in the globe. So these are not unique to the Northwest uh, in terms of, you know, as you can see, even with the similarities between the slide with the 10 global changes and, and what I've highlighted here. But natural variability plays a really, uh, is a really strong driver in the Northwest and, and other parts of the world. Things like the El, El Nino and La Nina, which many people have become very familiar with over the last decade or so, to the point that you know, the local weathermen will tell you what the forecast is for El Nino, uh, you know, which we are projected to actually have an El Nino this fall. There's about an 80% chance at this point. Uh, El Ninos tend to increase the odds for warmer, drier conditions in the Northwest, while La Nina tilts the odds for cooler and wetter conditions. And when you get these, you know, collections of these over time, it can, it can influence averages. We also have some other longer term modes of natural variability that create the same effect, warmer, drier, cooler, wetter. It's called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. All of these things are playing out simultaneously. So we have you know, we have it from any, you know, year to year, we have this variability. And what's happening is that over time, though, our long-term temperatures are increasing. So, you know, will we have cooler than average years in the future? Yes. The, will we have hotter than average years? Yes. More, you know, drier than average years? Yes. Wetter than average years? Yes. The issue is that the average around which that very variation is happening is going up over time. So we will, you know, as we, we will continue to see variability play a part. And as we look back at, at the observed changes, that influence of variability does make it hard for us to pull out and say this much of the change in temperature is due to human causes, whereas this much is due to variability. 
So we, th that is, we're getting to that. We mean in the scientific community. That kind of, it's called detection and attribution. It's been done for a number of things at the global scale where they can say how much of an observed change is due to human causes. And it's been done at the scale of the western U.S. for temperature, snowpack, and changes in stream flow. But as you try to bring that down to smaller scales, it, it gets more difficult. All right, so what is expected? Uh, as Yogi Berra says, uh, the future ain't what it used to be. He also said you can observe a lot by watching, which is really, I think, a good, uh, which is a good, is a good thing for, you know, talking about observed trends. Um, all right, so the future ain't what it used to be. And, and as, you know, as, as probably you know by this point, the question is no longer if climate changes, but how much and how fast. So, that's interesting. Oh, okay. Um, we, there is rapid warming projected for the Northwest. All of the scenarios looked at to date uh, over the years. This is, not, this is not just a recent finding, but over the, the multitude of projections that have been developed for the Northwest, all of them project warming. Uh, in the range of 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100, kind of about 4 to 6 degrees Fahrenheit by the 2050s. That's the change in average annual temperature. We do expect to see more extreme heat events, and we do expect to see warming across all seasons with the most significant warming during the summer months. We also, you know, expect some changes in precipitation, but it's a little bit more ambiguous. There's not, we have a huge range of variability when, with precipitation, and that makes it harder to pull out uh, any, or to see any influence as a result of rising greenhouse gas emissions. So we do see, you know, some increase in average annual precipitation on the range of, I think, in the like, two to four percent by the end of the century. Uh, you know, the real story for us in the Northwest, of course, is the seasonality. And we do expect to see an enhancement of that seasonal cycle. So wetter winters, drier summers, and uh, more extreme precipitation events. And what I'm showing you with these two figures is, uh, the, are the results from a high and a low greenhouse gas emission scenario. That's what those labels are there. And you can see that you know, through about the mid-century, the projections stay fairly close together. As you move later into the century, they start to split. And that's because, uh, that's, where, uh, that's because of the greenhouse gas emission scenarios and the different assumptions that we're making about future increases in greenhouse gas emissions. Through the 2050s, we have pretty good confidence about where we'll be because we already know, you know, we know how many people are on the planet. We know what our energy technologies are. We know that you don't just walk away from coal, you know, that these plants have about 30 years, you know, 30, 50 years life expectancy. We know how long it takes generally for new automotive technologies to, to work their way into the fleets or into the vehicles on the road. It's about 18 years. You know, so because of that, we, can, we have a pretty good sense, or at least a much better sense of where our future greenhouse gas emissions are going to be over the next couple of decades. Once you start getting into the 2050s, though, that's really where, you know, assumptions about population projections really start to diverge. That's where changes in the energy sources can really start to um, differentiate themselves. So, you know, the low emission scenarios, assuming of, uh, you know, much more uh, widespread use of green energy technologies and lower, as a result, lower emissions, whereas the other scenarios, the high emission scenario, assumes still heavy use of fossil fuels. So those range of possibilities really start to expand in the later part of the century, and as a result, you start to see this divergence in, in the, and this in bigger spread in the temperature projections. But, you know, as I, you know, as I noted very clearly, you know, above our 1970 to 1999 average uh, very clear, robust findings that we will be uh, dealing with warming. But, you know, it's, it's relatively flat for precip. So as you can see, there's just, again, not a lot of, not a big story with precipitation or, or at least not a very clear story. So uh, changes, uh, you know, Warming temperatures cause more winter precipitation to fall as rain rather than snow. So in the mountains, what we see is uh, less snow accumulating over the winter. That doesn't mean there won't be any snow in the mountains, but it just means that we will see less snow as a result of these warming winter temperatures. And this, you know, on the order of about, you know, 40, 45% by the 2040s, 65% by the 2080s. Those are obviously very substantial changes. 
The red shading is showing you where the losses are. You'll notice that um, it's actually fairly, you know, this, that's kind of white in the middle, and that's because that's the higher elevation where you see less change. But by the time we get to the end of the century, you're still seeing substantial losses. North Cascades doing a little bit better than the rest of the state. This is for a moderate emission scenario, slightly different scenario than the previous. And we do expect as a result of changes in temperature and snowpack to see changes in stream flow. This is a hydrograph for the Skagit. So what this shows is from October to September, uh, this, is how, this is how water managers think of the year. We actually, there was a water manager at uh, Seattle Public Utilities on October 1st every year. He would send out an email, happy new water year, with a poem because it was the new water year. Um, I didn't get one of those on January 1st, only on October 1st. And this just is its basically a map of, of how much water is moving through the system. And what you see in this gadget, and this is common for a lot of watersheds in, the, in Washington where you have uh, this mix of rain and snow, is in the fall, we get the fall rains coming back, so stream flows go up because there's more water coming down the river. But then it gets cold enough for that precipitation to actually start falling as snow. So stream flows actually go down because now you're building up a snowpack. And then in the spring, when temperatures warm up, you get the big pulse of spring snow melt as all that snowpack starts to melt. It peaks and then it drops down into our traditional summer low flow period. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to have warming winter temperatures. Maybe it looks like increasing winter precipitation, but really the key driver for changes in the rivers or the, in the snowpack is the warming winter temperatures. What we see in the 2020s is that more of the, the stream flows start to go up in the winter again because you're getting more of that rain now. And a reduction in the spring because now we haven't built up as much snowpack. And it's, it's kind of starting to shift over a little bit because those temperatures in the spring are warming up a little bit earlier. 2040s, more pronounced, more winter stream flow, less spring peak, and earlier low flow season because that water is essentially, that pulse of water has moved through the river sooner. And by the 2080s, you see a fundamentally different hydrograph for the Skagit where now, instead of the peak of the runoff coming in April, May, June period, or June, July, it's actually coming now in the winter. So a, a big transformation in the behavior of that river. This is a river that's already prone to flooding, as you know, uh, in the winter. So if we add to that increasing precipitation, we now see an increased flood risk in this gadget, and also decrease or an increased risk of droughts or just summer, lower summer flows, which can create issues for salmon and water quality. Sea level rise, of course, is a big issue, and uh, especially here. <laughs> you know? And these are the projected uh, scenarios for really the Northwest, and that has to do with the way that the National Research Council did this study. They gave a point-specific projection for Seattle, but, but largely the numbers are the same for all of the Northwest. And what we see is, you know, there is the potential for some sea level fall, again, depending on what happens with plate tectonics and other things. But by the end of the century, uh, a very clear sea level rise in, in areas around the city of Seattle. So a range of four to 56 inches, okay? Not a very satisfactory answer. You know, we've, we've often been in meetings with, with uh, folks from the state or city of Seattle and others, and, you know, like four to 56 inches, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> you know, and it's, it's tough. It's tough. It's, it's a big range. A lot of this has to do with uh, also, you know, at this point, what happens with the Greenland ice sheet and some of these other ice sheet dynamics, and there's some big assumptions made in there about those. They have to kind of bracket the range of possibilities with those ice sheets and, of course, with the plate tectonics. You know, what you do with that really depends on what you're trying to build. Are you putting in a dock or are you putting in a new wastewater treatment plant? If you're putting in a dock, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's 4 or 56 inches. It's, a, it's an easy decision to adapt. It's, you know, it's not as, it's not the same capital of investment as, say, a wastewater treatment plant where your risk tolerance may be much lower, and as a result, 
it may make financial sense and, and sense from a risk management standpoint to plan for that 56 inches or something close to that. So these are, this is kind of how we work on a value, you know, or work through these, these range of values. It's, it really comes down to risk tolerance and what is the nature of the decision being made. So, you know, changes in temperature, changes in snowpack, changes in stream flow, changes in sea level, all of these have uh, wide-ranging impacts. I am not going to go into the details of these. I just want to bounce kind of across at the 30,000-foot view and just point out that we do expect, as a result of these changes, decreased summer hydropower production, uh, which is an issue, but actually our dominant hydropower season is winter. So, uh, but this does create some new challenges for balancing hydropower generation with fish flows. And those, you know, fish are going to be Cold water species like salmon will be uh, more sensitive to rising water temperatures as a result of decreasing stream flows. Uh, decreased irrigation supply reliability. Overall, the municipal water supplies in Washington state are, are looking, at least the ones that are snowpack dependent, are, are looking pretty good. Uh, and that's in terms, if you define success as meeting the 98% reliability standard, which is the key metric for a public water supplier, and, and that's great. But they're often juggling water supply with fish flows and other environmental needs. And that's where the trade-offs really start to come into play. How easily can they meet these standards while meeting other environmental objectives? Groundwater, we don't really know how groundwater would be affected. It really, and that's partially because groundwater is so varied. You know, it really depends on the soils how quickly that groundwater source responds to changes in winter precipitation and then the summer or summer dry periods. So uh, if it's hydraulically connected to a river. So it's, it's hard to have a kind of broad summary point for groundwater, which I know is, um, you know, for private water supply wells, it's, that's obviously a key question. I've mentioned the increased risk on cold water species like salmon, and the increased flood risk, particularly west of the Cascades, and reduced water quality issues like temperature, turbidity because of sediment loading. Uh, sediment loads are projected to go up in the Skagit, for example, during the winter months because of the higher flows. You can also get more um, landsliding in the upper water, up in the upper reaches of the rivers that can then contribute sediment loads. Increased erosion can also increase sediment loads. Com that may have some benefits potentially for uh, tide flats though. It's not, it's not a, a completely negative thing that we have these sediment loads going through. If those sediments get out and get deposited in the, in the mud flats and the tide flats, that could actually help the tide flats uh, respond to rising sea level. If you can get, so, you know, it's change, some of which we can easily identify as being problematic. And in other cases, it's change. And who's the winner and who's the loser will really depend on how quickly things change and where, like for example, in this example, where the sediments settle out. We do expect to see an increased risk of wildfire as a result of changes in, uh, for example, pests. Uh, or in diseases, as well as just drier soil, uh, drier soil content, soil moisture, and uh, insect increased risk of insect outbreaks and changes in species distribution. So this is this is a in reference to the climate suitability. So our our tree species are here because it's the right climate for them, and as our climate changes those seedlings may have a harder time getting established because now they're in a less optimal environment. And that's really what will prompt changes in this distribution of those species over time. With sea level rise, a key issue is inundation. And this is the impact that most people tend to think of. These, and this is an example of some of the work that's been done by the city of Olympia and the city of Seattle to look at which areas are inundated by sea level rise. And, mm, uh, there's a lot of action happening around the issue of sea level rise, primarily, I think, because you can map it. And if you can map it, you can see it. If you see it, you can act on it. It's like the old thing, if you can measure it, you know, if you can count something, you can act on it. It's, it kind of goes along that lines. Uh, so there's quite a bit of work that's going on. And interestingly enough, in Seattle, there are also 
uh, bringing in a really strong focus on environmental justice because what they have seen is that with, through this mapping is that a number of the uh, areas affected by sea level rise in the Seattle area are actually areas that are um, uh, more racially diverse, economically diverse, and are communities where you, that aren't necessarily as able to deal with these kinds of impacts as other parts of Seattle. So um, this has galvanized a, a conversation across departments and, and has really raised awareness of the potential for disparate impacts on communities uh, down in, in kind of the Duwamish area in Seattle. City of Olympia, this is Capitol Lake. Uh, this is looking at the 100-year water level with just six inches of sea level rise. So they were primarily interested in flooding. How much of, of Olympia gets flooded with six inches of sea level rise? They already have a big problem with flooding now, as it is, even with no sea level rise. So for them, this is an issue that is important to deal with today. And while they're dealing with it, they also want to be taking into account how this problem could get exacerbated because of sea level rise. But beyond sea level rise, and probably long before we actually see permanent inundation of these low-lying areas, are the increased challenges of flooding, erosion, and habitat loss. And ocean acidification, uh, I know you guys have heard a lot about this. It is uh, showing up on the Washington coast decades earlier than expected. And one of the reasons why it's become such a um, a key issue globally, why there's such a, a global focus on the Northwest is because uh, we have this issue emerging here earlier than in other parts of the world, but also we have some really fantastic researchers here who are um, doing some really great work to get a better sense of both the causes and consequences of ocean acidification. A lot of that work's being done right here at Friday Harbor Labs, so that's, that's exciting. But we, you know, the things that are exacerbating ocean acidification along our coast here, are the strong coastal upwelling, one of the reasons why we're seeing it so much earlier is because of that coastal upwelling, which is already bringing up water low in uh, pH and high in CO2, just by fact that it's been at depth. And because of biological processes, it's just already low oxygen, high CO2 water. But now it's also getting, what's getting added into that is that higher CO2 from the atmosphere that's going and getting absorbed by the water. So we have both, in the case of the ocean acidification, we both have, you know, we have some natural causes as to why we would already be seeing it here, but we, that's getting exacerbated by these human causes and essentially accelerating the process. So as I noted, you know, all, there are, all communities in the Northwest are going to be dealing with these changes to varying degrees, but I want to take a moment just to focus or just to highlight and emphasize that the tribal communities are affected in ways that are uh, particularly important for those communities. I mean, in addition to just de to dealing with the impacts on their infra on the infrastructure on their reservations, they also have these cultural uh, cultural connections that are at risk as a result of climate change. Uh, through the loss and decline of key plant and animal species, through the loss of uh, culturally significant sites due to sea level rise, for example, and through the you know physical loss of reservation land. And in Alaska, these kinds of changes, the Alaskan tribal communities have been heavily impacted by observed, or by the warming to date. And in Alaska, there's been a very strong link between the impacts that they've seen and increasing incidents of alcohol abuse and suicide and domestic violence and other problems. So these, these, these stresses have very real consequences for Native communities, which are so closely tied to the resources and, and um, the resources of the region. So it's just something I wanted to put a nod in here towards. All right, so I promise not to be depressing, and I know I've kind of like bottomed us up, out, <laughs> bottomed us, but I'm now going to pull us back up. Um, what are our choices for dealing with this not-so-new reality, right? This is not so new because there's actually been more than 30 years of research just on the impacts alone, versus, you know, plus there's been 150-plus years of, of research saying, hey, you know, these greenhouse gases will warm the atmosphere. Well, um, this is certainly one option. We could just assume it's not a problem, it's convenient. We've got enough on our plates already. Um, we could just deny it, okay? 
we could wait until the option two, we could wait until the science has resolved the uncertainties and then decide what, if any, action to take. Does, do you guys know what this reference is to? Waiting for Godot, Waiting for Godot right. Um, I think we have about as much luck as they have in waiting for uncertainty to be, quote unquote, settled or resolved. We could put all of our energies, no pun intended, into reducing greenhouse gases, that's mitigation. We could put all of our efforts into preparing for climate change, that's adaptation. This is actually the, I'm not gonna say it right, but Maislent storm surge barrier in the Netherlands, which closes when they're expecting a big storm surge, they will close it to protect the low-lying areas. There's been discussion, there's something similar in the Thames, the Thames barrier. There's been discussion about putting something like this uh, by New York City at the cost of something on the lines of, seven, I think, 17 or $18 billion was the initial estimate for putting in this kind of a tide gate or storm surge barrier in front of New York City. And then that conversation got started after Hurricane Sandy. We could engineer our way out of it. This is uh, something called geoengineering, and I think it was probably something that was on the fringe for a long time, but I expect that it's probably working its way towards uh, a bigger part, or at least having some role in some of the conversations, which is this idea of, you know, can we somehow fix this problem by intervening with you know, the concentration in the atmosphere. So this is actually an example of something that was out there years ago of injecting um, sulfur dioxide into aircraft and carrying it up to the stratosphere and releasing that sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere because sulf those fine particulates will actually uh, reflect more sunlight back out into space. So the idea is to essentially increase the particulate matter in the atmosphere. And, uh, you know, one of the, it's been pointed out, like one of the unintended consequences possibly of cleaning up our air, like through the Clean Air Act regulations, has actually been to remove a lot of the particulate matter, which has been great for people who suffer from asthma, but may have also helped contribute to warming temperatures because now we don't have all that particulate matter reflecting some of that solar energy out into space. Um, so I guess you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. All right, so which option is correct? I'm, have you guys caught the fact that I have put references into movies from the, the, the 90s, uh, television shows from the 80s, 70s and 80s? You know, this is, this is good. I've, I've done this uh, in, in, in a few cases for classes at UW. You know, I mentioned Cliff Clavin, and they're like, who? <laughs> I'm like, oh. Um, all right, so is it Richard Dawson? And survey says. All right, okay, trick question, you guys know the answer. There's no, you know, none of those options by themselves are, are, are correct. And really, frankly, the first one, you know, denying it altogether, or forgetting about it, acting like it's there, is just not even an option at all. We know that we need to mitigate and adapt. And it's funny because for, there was a long time where having these two things in the same conversation was a big no-no. That was mm-mm. And that was because if you were talking about adaptation, that meant you were giving up on mitigation. And if, you know, and, and if you were talking only about mitigation, it was meaning that you were kind of ignoring the fact that we have these changes that are occurring and we're gonna to need to adapt to them. Those, you know, and this was a very real tension in the scientific community, and, you know, particularly in the 90s, where you, know, you, know, you, just, you really couldn't talk about adaptation. And, and you know, that has changed. That's been part of this change that I've mentioned over the last 14 years, where people are realizing that this is not an either or situation, and, and we don't have that choice, that we need to be doing both. And also that doing both doesn't mean that you are diminishing the value of, of any one thing. So talking about adaptation does not mean that you're walking away from mitigation. And in fact, what we have found is that Talking about the impacts and through the research that we've been doing and, and others like this, you know, others in the region and others in the country, this kind of information on climate impacts really stimulates the conversation on mitigation. Because, you, you know, it's not until you really start seeing what the problems might be at home to the places and the issues that you care about, that people will start saying, I don't like that. You know, I just don't, that's not going to work for me. Let, you know, we really need to get going on this. So, 
so we have found actually that, that it's kind of like, it's like the gateway drug to mitigation. Uh, you know, <laughs> adaptation is. It seems like denying mitigation or adaptation, either one, they're both sticking your head in the sand. Yes. I think that that's, that's a very fair statement that they are. So what does adaptation look like? I think people are very comfortable with what mitigation looks like because it's been such a prevalent part of the conversation for you know, two decades, three decades now. And, you know, and, and lots of great work going on in that. And I love the idea of the solar panels on the schools. I mean, it's um, fantastic. So, but what does adaptation look like? This is kind of still a, a new concept to a lot of people. And you know, honestly, because of Hurricane Sandy, there has been way more media coverage about this, this concept of adaptation in the last few years than ever before. And so some of this is getting more familiar. So it's, it's, it's doing things like increasing your water conservation measures, which back actually has mitigation benefits too. Um, if you reduce the, the amount of water that you need to treat, that actually has energy savings and the amount of water that you have to pump. So energy, you know, water conservation has both an adaptation benefit and a mitigation benefit, and there's, that's, that's not uncommon. Uh, you, strengthening dikes and levees where appropriate, incorporating climate change into habitat restoration decisions. So, uh, you know, perhaps uh, looking at some coastal areas and figuring out not just what you want to have now for today's habitat restoration needs, but how do you increase the long-term viability of that restoration effort by perhaps uh, expanding your focus a bit. And in some cases, moving sensitive facilities or equipment out of flood levels or the floodplain. You know, that's exactly what happens in, in, well, with the Anacortes Water Treatment Plant in Mount Vernon. In 2013, they opened up a new plant, $56 million plant, replaced uh, the previous plant, which I think was 40, 50 years old. And the um, Fred Buckmeyer, the, the, the utilities director, had been looking at information from the Skagit Climate Consortium, which we're part of, and looking at, at information showing changes in flood risk. I showed you the hydrograph for the Skagit, and a lot of research showing that sediment loads in the Skagit are supposed to go up. They were also interested in looking at how the salt wedge may come further up the, the Skagit River as a result of declining summer low flows, and uh, they were actually able to rule out that that won't be an issue for their plant. But the increasing sediment load and the increasing flood risk are issues. So they incorporated that into the design of the plant. And here's, you know, here's this quote here. I mean, this is, this, is, this is what we mean by like integrating adaptation thinking into the, our day-to-day -day jobs. You know, we were embarking on building a large facility, an expensive facility. I didn't want to waste people's money and have to replace it or remodel it in 50 years. It's going to be here for a while. This is Governor Inslee visiting. Uh, the governor was part of an adaptation, national adaptation task force pulled together by the White House, and I think this was part of his um, kind of bringing that message home. So, you know, so here's one example of adaptation in action, not in action. <laughs> so, <laughs> big difference, right? Here's another example of what adaptation looks like. This is uh, King County Wastewater Treatment Division. They will point out that they are already dealing with sea level rise. The a lot of the infrastructure for the King County Wastewater Collection System was put in back in the 40s. And since then, sea level has gone up. They already have problems with salinity, salt water, getting into the wastewater treatment system. What happens is that when we get big tides, the, the um, salt water from Puget Sound goes into the collection system, goes to the bright water treatment plant, and they're finding that they're actually having to treat salt water, which has added energy costs and also can affect the, the biology of the wastewater treatment plant. So the, the bacteria that, that break down the biosolids. So that's, so that's it's a cost issue and it's also a water quality, wastewater quality issue. So they are out there, actually now every time there's a high tide, they're out there testing the salinity. And well, high tide above a certain level. They're out there testing the salinity and they've been putting in flap gates and looking at where they can stop that salt water from coming into the system. And they've identified entry points and they're working on addressing that. They also have had some situations, they were building a pump station. They did some uh, modeling of how sea level rise may affect and, and with their system and which, uh, which facilities, you know, from pump stations out to the, you know, the big treatment uh, plants, which facilities are 
vulnerable to different amounts of sea level rise. And they found that, you know, at the time that they completed that study, they were installing a pump station that would have been vulnerable to some amount of sea level rise. And they realized, they talked to the, the contractor, and the contractor said, well, you know, we can just pour another, you know, four inches, six inches of concrete on the pad, and then we can put the electronics up here. And, and now that pump station is no longer vulnerable. So those are some of the easy examples of how adaptation is starting to unfold within the region. And it's these kind of things that get me excited because these are doable. And, and what happens is that other communities will hear John Phillips from King County or will hear Andy Haub from the city of Olympia, my next slide, and, and other folks talk about what they've done. And it legitimizes acting on climate change. It makes it OK, if that makes sense. You know, it, it, and we hear this a lot, you know, do you know what other communities are doing? Because I want to tell my council that. I call it the rush to be second. You know, there are very few, there are very few communities that are, I mean, there are some, you know, that are willing to go out, and they tend to be the big ones, the New York cities, you know, the, the Seattles, the um, Chicago's, you know, they're willing to go out there and kind of stick their necks out, so to speak, on some of these issues and break new ground. And then there's the whole slew of other communities who are right behind there at the gate waiting to go because they want to get on that band. They want to be doing those things, but they kind of need somebody else to prove that you can do it and not get, you know, hung on a rope politically for doing it. And so, you know, hence the rush to be second. And we're seeing that. We're seeing now these kind of medium-sized and small-sized communities come in and really start to run with this. So the city of Olympia, they have annual work plans to address um, sea level rise and flooding in the city of Olympia. And every, every year, Andy Halb and his staff will brief council. They have a community meeting that typically gets about 100 people coming to hear what the city's been doing. They have done uh, a series of analyses to look at options for uh, how to deal with the flooding. Some of them have been easy options, like consolidating the number of stormwater outfalls that go into Bud Inlet. They have also had conversations of whether are there parts of downtown that we could abandon if we needed to. And you know, they've concluded that they can't. They, you know, it's, it's very flat. There's a lot of critical arterials. There's really no part of downtown Olympia that you can just kind of lop off and say, you know, it's OK to flood that. So that has now stimulated the conversations about, you know, what kind of flood protections, both natural and man-made, do we want to put in? Um, they have increased their setback requirements with the expectation that in the future, on, on their shoreline plans, with the expectation that in the future, they may have to have some kind of either, you know, built levees or uh, other infrastructure in place to protect the downtown. And they have actually talked about the potential for tide gates and butt inlets. So all of these are um, things that they're pricing out. They're not needing to act on any of these quite yet on some of these bigger ideas. But the, they're having that conversation. They're getting a sense of what it means for the community. And they're starting to build, you know, make decisions around those that leave those long-term options open, such as you know, increasing the setback to allow more shoreline space for um, future protection measures if needed. All right, so the other side of adaptation that we tend to not think about, at least, you know, the media sees this part. Governments see this part. I mean, yes, governments are involved in that, but this is the other side that we tend to forget about. And this is about building the capacity of our organizations, of our local governments, of our state governments, even the federal governments, of our tribes, of businesses, this is in the private sector too, to, to actually take in this information and to start acting on it. So there's a lot of you know, financial barriers, regulatory barriers, cultural barriers, institutional siloing that can really inhibit action on climate change. And by looking at adaptation as a two-prong approach, you know, looking both internally and externally, you, get, uh, you, you definitely are likely to get farther in your adaptation pursuits. All right, so you know, at its heart, it's really adaptation is really about asking, how does climate change affect what I do, what I'm trying to accomplish, and do I need to do anything differently as a result? You know, interestingly enough, when people ask that question, they don't always have to do something different. I think there is this this expectation that we have to do everything totally different, and 
part of going through this process of evaluating impacts and vulnerabilities is to really help focus our energies. We have limited resources, so where does it make sense to focus those? There is a lot of, uh, of adaptation work that's happening at the state level. This is at a, uh, just a snapshot as of July 2014. Uh, the states that are in blue have adaptation plans completed. The states in green, they're in process. Uh, purple, it's recommended. And these are all the different organizations. This is not it, but these are organizations in Washington that have been working on adaptation. Um, and you know what? A lot of these are working on mitigation, too. And in fact, if I had the slide for who's working on mitigation, I can guarantee you it would be a lot more crowded. But I don't track that work um, uh, as, part of my, uh, as part of what I do. So, you know, federal agencies that are working in the region, uh, and then state governments, tribal governments, local governments. All right. So we've gotten really good at making plans. The implementation, well, I mean, how many of you have made the plans, the checklists, right? You know, and you have the best intentions to get them done. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is where we've seen this great flurry of activity in, in developing these plans. And, we'll, and, and then when it comes to implementation, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's where the really heavy lifting begins. And it's where the conversations can get complicated. And as a result, it's where everything slows down. So why is it hard? It's not impossible, but why is it hard? It's a politically charged subject still. And, and, and it will be for some time. It affects long-standing ways of doing things. You know, we, you know, we have ways that we've managed water, and that's the way it is. Uh, that's the way we do it, and you know, don't mess with that system, right? It deals with science. Eee, uh, you know, there are, <laughs> you know, and, and this is even in the political discourse, there, um, there has been this kind of growing dislike for science <laughs> in the political conversation. Science in some circles is a bad thing. Um, in other circles, it's, you know, it's something that, you know, local governments haven't really had to bring into the conversation, really wrestle with. Um, so there's you know, a little bit of technical training there. Uh, it involves uncertainty. Well, doesn't everything, um, certainly. But we, we have, you know, people like to put the uncertainty around climate change in a different camp than the uncertainty associated with economic projections or other kind of the kind of the traditional uncertainties that people have gotten comfortable with. And I think this is starting to shift. I think this will shift over time. People will, I think people will realize over time that, you know, these uncertainties are going to stay there. And so we just have to move, move beyond that, get over it, kind of, so to speak. Uh, it involves potentially expensive changes. Sure, you know, a $17 billion floodgate for uh, New York City, that's no small factor. Uh, and it involves potentially scary changes. You know, there's no getting around that. Some people will hear the projections, and it's, it can cause shutdown. And that's actually been a real big learning point in, in communication around climate impacts is, um, and, and climate science is that if you get up there and you just basically say, we're toast, see ya, you know, I'm, I'm done with my talk, um, people are just, they, they'll shut down. They get defensive. Um, they don't want to hear about it. I, I have to confess to doing that last night. I was listening to a town hall speaker on KUOW who was talking about climate change, and I had to turn him off. I'm like, I work with this, and you're depressing me. <laughs> you know? You know, like I could not have imagined a pay to go to town hall and hear this guy talk. So uh, for some, it confronts religious beliefs. And this is, this is true. You know, this is not just a US thing. This is true globally. There's a really interesting researcher at University of British Columbia who had done some work with um, communities in the Pacific Islands. And he found, you know, regardless of whether they come from Christian belief systems or other belief systems, there's this notion that, that some people have that, that there's an agreement with God that we would not, that he would not flood the earth again, or he would not harm humanity after the Great Flood. Uh, and so there, there, there's this contractual agreement that this just is not going to happen. And that is, for some people, a very real stumbling block to, uh, to wanting to, to listen and act on the science. And then for others, it's a, you know, going back to this politically charged issue, it is, uh, you know, I joked about adaptation being the gateway drug 
to mitigation, well, for some, they, and I, and I have heard this directly, they believe, for people, some people who are, who are more conservative or, you know, what we would say is politically on the right, they recognize that climate change is a problem, but somehow, you know, if they kind of say, okay, we need to act on climate change, it somehow means that you're buying into all of the other issues that are advocate, had been advocated by the environmental community, right? Because most of the advocation for, for climate change has traditionally come from the environmentalist community. And so it can, be, it can be very hard for people to say, yes, I agree with this, but I don't agree with these issues. And you know, so it creates a barrier to that dialogue. And it almost becomes, this, you've seen this, climate change has almost become this litmus test issue in the political campaigns. It's, it's that are you with me or are you against me kind of thing. And, and that's what, you know, that was something that it was really, for me, thought provoking with um, the last federal election was just how climate change has become this, this litmus test. You either, you know, if you, you know, if you believe that climate change is an issue and you have, we have to deal with it, it's, that's a deal breaker, you know, right then and there. So that's why it can get hard. But what are some of the benefits? It's not impossible and there are lots of benefits. Uh, you know, really, this is a risk management issue and when it, we're, we're talking about needing to protect the investments that we've made in our communities in terms of the infrastructure and the services. We don't, you know, and you saw that with the, the comment from Fred Buckmeyer. It's about reducing future exposure. You know, if we can't, we recognize that we have these problems, if we can make corrections now and to, you know, in our plans so that we're not increasing our exposure. I mean, yes, we have our built-in exposure and our built-in vulnerabilities based on decisions of the past, but we have an opportunity to use this information to reduce our exposures going, and going forward. And that has cost savings. We have the potential to improve habitat conditions and the benefits we get from ecosystem services by starting to think more holistically about these solutions. We're not going to build our way out of a lot of these problems. You know, we're not going to build our way out of stormwater management problems, and you're seeing that shift. Uh, that, that shift was already started before projections of increasing precipitation came in, but people are recognizing we're, we, you can't build enough stormwater pipes to deal with intense precipitation. So we need to start looking at the low impact development and ulterior alternative ways of managing stormwater. And similarly for, you know, sea level rise impacts and erosion, this combination of these gray green infrastructures and some neat work that, that the Nature Conservancy is doing in the Skagit uh, with the gray green infrastructure mix. You're seeing thing, this program, floodplains wide design, where there's um, kind of a, a growing recognition and I think climate change will add to that of this need to think more holistically and then while we're doing that there's going to be a lot of additional benefits that we'll get out of that. And ultimately we get more resilient communities and, and more resilient ecosystems. This is where I, you know, earlier when I said that I'm hopeful, this is where I think that a lot of the conversation around mitigation and adaptation, I, I think is pulling our, pulling the communities in a more sustainable path. And I realize that for, for some people sustainability is kind of a bad word. Um, but it's, it's pulling us towards making decisions and making choices that I think are going to be more resilient in the future and create these, these benefits that will go, that will provide benefits today. You know, the things that we do to reduce flood impacts have benefits today because we get big floods now. We don't have to wait for the 2040s and the climate projections to see the benefits from that. You know, the drought planning, and when we plan for, for, for increasing drought and we think about that and we incorporate that into our drought planning, we get the benefits of that thinking when the drought happens next summer, as well as when we get that bigger drought that happens, say, in the 2030s. All right, so how do we do it? You know, Rosie the Riveter, we do it through leadership. This was a key issue in King County. It's been a key issue at the state. Uh, we do it through public support and expectation for action. The city of Seattle said that they did some of their first evaluations of how climate change would affect their water supply system because people at public meetings were saying, how is climate change going to affect our water supply? You know, and we've had conversations with folks in D.C., you know, with feds and, and the elected officials, congressional staff. Well, you know, when we... We'll respond to this when we start hearing from our constituents that this matters to them. So speaking up matters. Uh, Olympia is in their work plans. You know, there's this expectation that every year Olympia, you know, the, the public work structure is going to come back and update 
the council and update the you know, city residents on what they're doing. Uh, positive messaging. Um, I, you know, yes, we have to talk about the impacts, which can be inherently a downer. Um, but at the same time, we need to not just leave it there and need to point out that there are ways of moving forward. And, and the, the kind of we can do it, you know. Um, and then the mainstreaming of adaptation, as I've, as I've shown, that, that, that not stovepiping climate change adaptation. We write our plan, we work on it over here, and now I'm going to go over here and do all, all these other things. We need to really bring our thinking about and our recognition about climate impacts into the everyday decisions that we're making, as well as the bigger long-term strategic planning decisions so that it really becomes incorporated and integrated and, and reflected in all the decisions that we're making. So I want to close just with this, this um, post from the Washington, or this editorial from the Washington Post. This was right after Hurricane Sandy. And the Washington Post is, is a very, um, it's a paper that in the past and has not been very supportive of action on climate change in any regard. And, and I can't say that, that, you know, after October 31st, 2012, they have um, totally switched and become super supportive of all things related to climate. Um, but I, this was a very, I thought, telling and powerful statement that, you know, at the national level, we need to get serious about this because, frankly, you know, the, many of the governors and a lot of the local officials, they get it. They're, they're working on it, and so now we kind of need the feds to hurry up. And they are. There's been a lot of action at the federal level. But it's about anticipating not just the historically unusual, but also the historically unprecedented. So. You know, I, you know, whizzed through a bunch of the impacts, and I guess, I, you know, I want to emphasize that these are not just hand wavy, yeah, this is what we think, you know, because that's just what makes sense. There's a hard science behind these, and a lot of that science you can find in these three documents. This is the National Climate Assessment Report, which I mentioned, which has, uh, was released in April 2014, has a, a chapter for the Northwest, a short chapter about, you know, 20 pages or so, uh, as well as sector-specific chapters, so coasts and tribes and the built environment and infrastructure. Uh, really, the, a good uh, kind of detailed look at the Northwest is this Island Press book, which is a 300-page document that goes into the details about projections for agriculture. Chad Kruger probably shared some of the results from that work uh, when he was here earlier, but uh, you know, agriculture, and hydrology and coastal systems and forests, et cetera. And then, you know, if you really don't feel like reading all of those, you can go to the, what we call the Cliff Notes version. This is a document we put out in 2013, December 2013. It is a, I call it the Cliff Notes version because it is bulleted summary statements. It's with the numbers at the end of each chapter. So we, we basically looked at, you know, we, we, we synthesized the syntheses, you know, including, you know, this document, the IPCC reports, into, and we synthesized it into these short chapters with bolded sentences, bulleted sentences, numbers at the end of the chapter, if you really want to get into the details. It's the quick reference guide, you know, if you just want that, that quick fact. Um, it's, you know, it's not short. I mean, it's, you know, it's 100 pages, but it's... Uh, easily digestible. And all, these two are, are both available from our website, the National Climate Assessment. You can just Google it. So thank you very much. Um, I, I hope I left you feeling motivated and empowered. Um, I want if to, you, if you really are a glutton for punishment, you can join us on September 9th and 10th at the 5th Annual Pacific Northwest Climate Science Conference. Uh, otherwise, if you're just a, a glutton for small amounts of punishment, you can email me or phone me anytime with questions, and <laughs> I'll uh, get back to you. You know, I'll find out what I'll find the information that you need. So, thanks.